Thank you everyone for coming along. So my name's Sean Richardson. I'm um, the Chief Weeds Officer for Midwest Regional Council. That's the local control authority for um, nox nox noxious weeds in this part of the world. And my brief today was really to talk about um, practical solutions or um, spray application techniques for serrated tuss tussocks specifically. So my background is I've worked in the agricultural industry for about 20 years, worked um, for a couple of fairly large major corporate companies like Syngenta and New Farm. We used to do a lot of this spray application work um, in horticulture and broadacre for many different applications. This is slightly different, this one, when it comes to specifically one weed. But um, I'm going to go through some of the, the techniques that I've observed, certainly some of the, the stuff that um, uh, anecdotally we've seen when it comes to inspections of properties with noxious weeds, um, some of the the best practice and certainly some of the things that we've observed that we could avoid and then just go through some of the practicalities of spraying. Before we start, one of the things that's really important is um, identification. So one of the, the things that we see very often when we go out to do property inspections is that um, there are a lot of dead plants, um, not all of them tussock, which is uh, unfortunate because later on when um, some of these uh, imminent speakers from the DPI go through their stuff. We'll talk about competition uh, and we'll talk about uh, the importance of having competition in a pasture sward. Hopefully, won't. Yep, that's good. So, uh, any ideas? We've got some tussock and we've got some other plants here. Who can, um, who can call out the tussock? What would you be spraying if you're um, faced with this uh, scenario of six plants here? We've got two that are putting all their cards down that way. What about this fella here in the... I'm not sure about that one. No. It's got some long things. No, it's a, uh, so We've got the botanist on the job. Christine McRae, everyone, if you haven't met Christine before. So we've got three pots so far that um, people are calling out. And we believe that this one's power tussock. What leads you to believe that? You don't know? It's got long... Yeah, the seed head. That's a great way of being able to tell. So the seed head is a really good giveaway. And you'll notice that um, the tussock seed doesn't have any seed head at the moment. That's one of the reasons I've been able to cart it around the district today. Important. This, this stuff is mostly gone by now. Like it doesn't retain its seed heads. No. Whereas this does. It does. That's exactly right. So this one here, it's a pretty easy one to guess, given that the seed head's still standing up pretty well. Um, but we do sometimes see them sprayed as well. Does anyone know what plant this is? Uh, no, close. It's kangaroo grass, well done. Yeah, kangaroo grass. We call it kangaroo grass here too, or thermuda. Uh, and this one here may be a little bit harder to guess. Any other bids? No. Um, it's probably one of the Australostipia species, um, and I suspect it's wire grass that I've picked up there this morning. So there are different species, mostly Australian natives, that are often very difficult to determine when it comes to actually identifying serrated tussock versus some of these grasses. And we, we, we often go out and see uh, plants like this one, the poa tussock, that have all been sprayed as well. And that is really unfortunate because it's an Australian native and under the um, Native Veg Act it's protected, so uh, it's uh, a bit of a no-no. In terms of um, identification, some of the techniques, obviously Christine went through some of them. Thank you very much, Christine. Important to, um, it's a, often the colour of the plant is a dead giveaway. The, um, the nature of the seed head is a dead giveaway. Um, when you go into the, the root structure, as you dig this plant up, um, it's often a, a matted root structure, it's white at the base, and then the actual leaf uh, is round and there's a ligule at the back of the leaf. So all those things are important. And when, you, when you've got gra grazing pressure, um, it is the plant that livestock generally won't, uh, won't eat. So from that perspective, um, if you've worked out that you've got tussock and you need to do something about it, let's start talking about the tools, the tools of the trade. So we, um, we would recommend and we use, as we brought in our quick spray unit uh, here this, this afternoon, um, this is our number one tool of the trade. 
Uh, it's actually the one that I used this morning when I was digging up these plants. So Matic, um, probably if you're an organic uh, operator, that's about as far as we're going to go today, is uh, you've got to do something physical with uh, your control. So most of the uh, other control methods are going to be uh, chemically based or um, mechanically based. So the Matic is a, is a good one. Um, a lot of operators will use that on their quad bike. And there's no reason you can't carry one around on your horse or something else. Um, that's what I use when I'm training my horses, not on the horse, if I come across any tussock. Um, another very popular product and one that um, we utilise in our vehicles when we're doing inspections is this flupropanate granule. And one of the quizzes I think that Claire's asking is, what's the group of the, um, the group of chemistry that it belongs to? <laughs> You'll know that it's on all the labels. Um, quick, quick quiz. If this was a group J chemistry and it's a granule, what would something like task force be? Yeah, probably would be the same. Well done. It's the group J2 because it's the same active. It's flupropanate. Now, the granule, in terms of um, utilisation, you don't need much. I think it's about 12 kilograms uh, recommended label rate per hectare. Um, what does that equate to when it comes to uh, a plant like this? Flupropanate going... So really it's a tiny little bit of, um, that's probably about half of what I'd require for an individual plant to, to go across that. Um, so how does, how, plant that size, yeah. yeah, plant that size. Um, so if you think about some of these bigger plants like this one down here, um, if I sprinkle that on there and happy days, job's done. Weed officer's um, gonna give me a clean bill of health. What needs to happen then? Rain and why is this? Okay, so the the mode of action or the way that flupropanate works is that most of it's taken up by um, the root system. Some a little bit is taken up if it's a foliar application through the leaf, but most of it's through the root system, and it'll need to, to be washed into the soil, be taken up by the root system, and then it'll translocate through the plant. So it can take um, three months, can take six months, can take quite a while to um to, to see the effect of the the granule. Will it affect those little ones? It will, so it'll have a residual control, and that's one of the great benefits of flupropanate. So Tony Cook's going to be talking about um, some alternative modes of action, alternative chemistries, but really flupropanate is still our, our main armoury in, in the toolkit when it comes to serrated tussock, and it's why it's so important that we protect that um, particular group of chemistries to um, maintain control. Um, so moving on from there, um, we've found out that we've got a few more plants than just the, the, uh, the, the three or the four that I've collected here this morning. We're going to have to do something a little bit more out of the box and just carry um, uh, half a kilogram of flupropanate granules around. The, the next thing that um, I would consider would be a backpack like this. And you can actually do an inordinate amount of, of spraying with a unit like this, it's amazing how much you can get done because you don't actually need a lot of chemistry to be able to control a plant. They actually, um, when I've done demonstrations uh, all across Australia and in different parts of the world, in fact, uh, a lot of the small um, uh, lifestyle farmers or the um, small farmer holdings through Asia, etc. This is all they use. This is really all that they have access to. Um, they can operate it up to about four bar of pressure. So um, this nozzle at the end is a, basically a, a um, medium coarse droplet. Not that important. Normally you'd be doing your spraying through, um, through winter, I guess. Although, um, any insights into when you should be spraying your tussock? Well done, that's exactly right, you should never stop. So if you've got it there, you just keep going. Um, so this one here, um, you can see that we've got a quite even fan of um, spray distribution. Quite important that um, when you're considering your spray mix, so if I'm using flupropanate, 
It can be quite, le quite deleterious on other native grasses. So really we want to spray that plant. And that's probably about it. That's all we need to do. And then move on to the next one. Um, we often recommend if the plant's coming in to seed to mix some glyphosate in your mix. So if you're using um, 10 litres in your backpack here, the rate's uh, 250 mils per um, 100 litres. So if you think about that as a 10% of your solution, you've got 10 litres instead of 100. That's 25 mils. It's not a lot of product. Um, in here I've got water because... Yeah, flu propionate, yep. 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 Flu propionate. So if you're using gly glyphosate, um, a similar sort of mix, it can be slightly higher. But remembering too that if you're going to use um, glyphosate, you're going to kill everything around this plant. So if you can be uh, quite well directed, that's cool. But if you can't, then um, you're going to have a big circle of... You can do quite a large area, maybe um, an acre or a little bit more, depending on the thickness of the sward, um, with a backpack. And one of the great things with a backpack is that you don't have to drag all your hoses, you can walk all over your field. Um, anecdotally, again, one of the things that we've seen when people are using um, glyphosate in their mix is that within 9 to 14 days you'll know where you've been, whereas if you're not um, using that then you need to have some sort of marker. Um, spray dyes are often handy and they're commercially available through um, all your reseller stores. Um, obviously a spray dye is not going to work with this one here. So what we often will use is a, um, like a fluorescent marker. It's the spray um, packs that our roads crew or colleagues at council will use um, and just mark up the plant so you know you've been there. Because you don't want to keep going back and, and putting uh, flupropanate granules on the same plant. So we've got to this stage, we've realised that um, the tussock infestation is fairly significant and we probably need to um, pull out all stops. Where do we go from here? What are the other options that are available? Yeah, we start going up into the more serious um, bits of kit. So a, a quick spray is probably considered best practice when it comes to, well, units like that are considered best practice when it comes to large infestations. And spot spraying is probably the most effective way to um, get at your, uh, your weed infestation but without going through your, your whole pasture sward. Um, sometimes it's not that practical. Sometimes you really need to think about um, broad acre type spraying scenarios. Uh, and that can be really challenging in our, um, in our environment because we've got a lot of hills, we've got a lot of rocks, we've got a lots of uh, other equipment um, issues when it comes to driving around, safety issues. So one of the things that um, we're considering, and I know Craig's sitting there, they utilise this sort of stuff, technology on their spray units over at Wellington, is a boomless spray. So a boomless spray, we're going to just fit that up to the back of our unit um, and then we can spray like a boom um, without having the arms and other sorts of uh, paraphernalia hanging off the back of our vehicle that's going to get caught on a tree or a rock or something when we're going around um, some fairly challenging territory. If the territory is really challenging, what's the only other option? It's probably a helicopter. The sward with bar pressure on your spray unit. So you're talking about the bar pressure on the spray unit. Um, the bar pressure will help you with your the sward swath of your spray um, width. They're not terribly exact science. So one of the things that you'll always find is if you're using a, a boom spray, you're going to get much more accuracy than if you're using one of these things. So you need to think about um, how you would come back and. and you often will see wind or other things that affect um, spraying will, will affect you more, more so with one of these sorts of items. Um, yes, so that's a good question. I'm not sure if um, everyone heard it, but can you overspray? Uh, it's, it's a really important point to remember that it does have a residual in the soil. So if you're using um, three litres per se of task force flu propanate per hectare, you'll get a great residual sure as eggs, but you won't get any growth come back. If we think about it as a group, why would you use a granule compared to um, carrying this around or spray unit? Yeah, so that's exactly right. So the ease of use is a really good one. Um, 
another reason would be environmental. So if you're putting on with helicopter over trees, other sorts of things, it's going to be less deleterious to the, to the uh, natural environment, natural ecosystem. So there are a few reasons why you might consider one rather than the other.